There's no way, I, I don't believe there's a way to really scale a business up where you're just having to play CEO and COO together in one role mm -hmm. uh, where there's not some separation, where you have kind of like an outside guy and an inside guy. Mm -hmm. And that's also another distinction I see as it. Welcome to Modern Entrepreneur. Today we have Dan Reitman who founded his first company, Stroll, while in college and ran that company for 15 years. He turned Pimsleur into the second largest language learning brand in the US and close to a $100 million product line. For seven years in a row, Stroll was on the Inc. 5000, the Philadelphia 100, and the Internet Retailer's Top 500 list. Today, Dan's got a consulting company, Growth Harmony, which holistically helps seven and eight figure companies grow to the next level. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, thanks, appreciate it. Yeah, so um, tell me what you feel like is your unique skill set and how that helped you grow from like your college dorm room into a $100 million a year business. I think that one of the most powerful things that I've been able to do is really understand what I'm good at mm -hmm. and what I'm not great at mm -hmm. and then ultimately shift all my energy towards the things that I'm good at. So when I think about unique ability, um, as a leader, I mean, you really have to make the decision whether you're more the visionary type or you're more the operational type. Mm -hmm. and I mean, there's many labels for this. Um, uh, there's a book, The, uh, the Self-Made Billionaire Effect, and it talks about kind of the, the producer versus the performer. Mm -hmm. um, there's a book called Rocket Fuel that makes the distinction between the visionary and the integrator. Mm -hmm. But in any case, there's this, this dichotomy where if you're really good at big ideas, big relationships, um, just basically thinking strategically, you know, you're, you're kind of moving towards one side right. and then if you're great at operations making sure that everything is taken care of in terms of like uh, the planning the details overseeing execution plans and all of that that's more like uh, a COO role mm -hmm. so we really made that distinction early on so I really got to focus on those things that I was good at I was able to um, I mean, I'm, I'm great at marketing already because that's a discipline I, I, I developed, but also I was great at building a network mm -hmm. of friends that were incredible marketers. And I got to see exactly what those businesses were testing and implementing. Mm -hmm. And it gave, um, allowed me a lot of times to connect the dots to things that we were doing mm -hmm. and giving us opportunities to be able to test and implement those things. So we always had an edge. So I feel like uh, my, my unique ability in one, one I mean, pretty clear on what they are, but one major one that helped us a lot was really uh, pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. Seeing um, seeing something out there and then being able to connect the dots to something we were doing and uh, being able to implement that. And we just had endless gains I mean, as a result of that. Mm -hmm. So in at uh, Stroll, were you the like CEO or visionary guy or were you in charge of the operations? I was the happen? CEO. Uh -huh. yeah. And so um, in that role, did you, uh, I mean, I, w I typically think of the CEO role as more of like um, longer term, bigger picture vision, where this organization is going, and uh, like what are we going to test next, more as a marketing operations type role. Um, but it sounds like you were actually like going out and getting the ideas and, and like handing them to marketing. Is that, is that how that works? Well, I mean, I think it's you're in partnership with everyone. Mm -hmm. I guess I kind of see it as you. There's certainly the, like, in an organization, it's kind of a pyramid where you expect the person at the top to be able to see further than everyone else at mm -hmm. different levels. Like, mm -hmm. one person sees five or ten years out, the other mm -hmm. person sees maybe three or five, mm -hmm. and then, you know, down to the day level, I need to pack these boxes and right. ship them out. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's certainly that dimension. Uh, but I would expect that everybody, like in your management team, should have strategic capability, strategic thinking capability. Yeah. So, I mean, you want to be among equals on one sense, so they at least have some layer of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, but then um, beyond that, I mean, it's it's. Um, I mean, somebody needs to have the freedom, the flexibility to not be trapped by the organization. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no way. I, I don't believe there's a way to really scale a business up where you're just having to play. CEO and COO together in one role mm -hmm. uh, where there's not some separation where you have kind of like an outside guy and an inside guy mm -hmm. and that's also another distinction I see as it so you have the luxury and the freedom to be able to think more creatively mm -hmm. you're able to spend more time on the outside and contemplating things that can help the business grow and get to the next level and then you bring them in some things are at the strategic level like hey have we considered going into these markets have we considered going to these product lines mm -hmm. and then 
I mean, if you have, uh, um, it all depends on where you're, I mean, each leader has their own kind of proficiency that they're really great at. So if you came up, and I mean, I, I knew all roles when I came up. I had to do tech. I built our systems initially, and then I structured different departments and all of that. But my passion really always was on the marketing side. Mm-hmm. So then also, I mean, if I see something tactical, I would at least bring it into the organization. And there, um, you know, you kind of have to make sure that, so one thing I've noticed is that most if you're in a high growth business, a lot of times most CEOs feel like even if it's growing dramatically fast, it's still growing too slow mm-hmm. because they have so many additional ideas mm-hmm. that they've come across or they've thought of that they might want to bring into the organization, but the organization is still digesting all the old stuff. Right. And so that's where that, there's that disconnect. But that's a good thing because you mm-hmm. won't always have like uh, an excess number of ideas and, and uh, growth initiatives that could come into the company. Mm-hmm. So, but if you don't have the freedom, you know, if you don't have that luxury, you can't do that. To take the time to like, you know, think and, exactly. and, and be out there uh, absorbing what other people are doing. Yeah, if you're always in the line of fire and right. so forth, mm-hmm. um, if you can't create that separation, I feel like it really limits you. Right. So now you've transitioned out of Stroll yeah. and uh, are, are starting this consultancy mm-hmm. with your executives. Yeah. So you took your, your um, sort of SWAT team and are now thinking that um, it's going to be a good idea to go into other businesses and kind of like bring your special sauce. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. so w- what is that special sauce that you guys specifically bring? So with the people I have on board, I mean, when we think of direct response companies, direct to consumer, it could be an individual, it could be a business owner, um, but really um, direct marketing slash e-commerce companies. Mm-hmm. I mean, the reality is you could, I mean, based on everything I've seen in our company and many other companies, I mean, I could I could come in and squeeze the revenue dramatically. I mean, mm-hmm. just really have um, ideas that could grow that. But the reality is, the the, the organization would explode mm-hmm. because usually that's not what holds a company back. It's mm-hmm. um, you have certain things where there's profit opportunities that are holding a company back, but then mm-hmm. it's the operation side too. Mm-hmm. At least that's what I've seen a lot. Mm-hmm. Is you need to. If you're going to grow revenue, you also need to be able to tame chaos. Mm-hmm. And chaos can come for direct marketing companies. It's uh, a lot of people don't know how to measure their numbers, or they know it on the front end, but they don't know it on the back end. Or if they know it on the back end, they don't know what it is at a contribution margin level. Mm-hmm. So, like when you fully cost all the orders, how much how much is actually contributing towards uh, operating towards over uh, operating expenses towards overhead? So, even then, if you know that, they might not know lifetime value by acquisition source and even if they knew that they don't know how to do how to like tie that into the financials to know what the cash flow impact is Mm -hmm. and they don't know how to forecast Mm -hmm. so there's this inherent limit they don't know how to leverage their cash to be able to scale their business Mm -hmm. and so um even if you can solve a lot of these things, then there might be something else like on the technology side. So when you get into all the aspects of an organization, it's like if you can holistically look at it Mm -hmm. because you have like great leaders in all those areas, operations, technology, analytics, mm-hmm. um, marketing, um, you can really um, take a precision approach to a business and figure out what things need to be done first, but what also needs to happen so that the organization is going to be able to keep up with the, um, with the new you know, enhanced revenue. Yeah. So that's kind of what we want to do. We want to be able to take seven-figure businesses, turn them into eight-figure businesses, take eight-figure businesses, turn them into nine-figure businesses, and basically, um, uh, you know, right now it's kind of like on a partnership basis in terms of, you know, taking a fee and then having um, upside. In long term, it's probably really just acquiring companies and, and doing it for ourselves. Mm-hmm. So I feel like if we can create incredible case studies uh, with people from a co- consulting standpoint, then it puts us in a, in a in a great position to choose what we want to do next. Mm-hmm. We can continue to work with clients and and help them get to the next level, or um, you know who knows? I mean, th- there are so many opportunities out there. Raising a fund, doing it ourselves. I sure. Mean, the, so a lot of those things that you just listed, the things that uh, kind of like business owners don't know, um, are some pretty advanced ideas that like. Quite frankly, probably a lot of the um, people that are going to watch this are not, also don't know, and um, and and are and, and like probably didn't even know they needed to know, and um, and because little businesses aren't thinking, you know, about like matching, the, you know, their uh, you know customer acquisition channels and the cost of goods sold to a projection model, and you know, like they're they're just not they're not 
there yet, right? right. Thinking about those kind of things. Um, at what point do you think that those kind of skills need to be in a business to not like really be screwing things up? Well, because that's that is, it's not necessary to be like thinking about that stuff from day one, right? No, no. Look, it all depends on the market. So mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to be invited by Dan Gilbert and his team to see Quicken Loans in 2012. So um, we kind of flew to uh, Detroit and got to go in their offices and meet their team. And mm -hmm. they have this um, bronze sculpture on the wall, which is basically um, a replica of a whiteboard they had at the end of 2008 during mm -hmm. the housing crisis, yeah. where they were really concerned about you know where the economy was going and where their business could go. And so the old, like, all these executives got together and, and basically plotted out some different ideas on a whiteboard and somebody said, hey, well, let's, let's look at our entire funnel, the entire, all the touch points in the business. And so they took turns, they went up and uh, basically plotted out the funnel, plotted out the metrics, and they realized in that exercise that if they plugged certain leaks, it could transform their business. Mm -hmm. And I mean, today they're a, they're a leader you know, in, in the home mortgage industry. And what we realized in seeing that is, wow, this is something we had to do when we were in the um, millions and mm -hmm. they did this in the billions. So yeah. it all just depends on the market. But it's like when you look at your business really analytically, you, mm -hmm. can, find pl you can find pockets of opportunity that can just transform it. So yeah. I feel like it's, you, you um, I mean the bottom line on all the stuff I mentioned really is just how can you spend more money to acquire more customers mm -hmm. so that you can just increase your reach in terms of like, you know, if you've got a great product and service, how can you help more people with it? Mm -hmm. That usually just takes a larger advertising budget to be able to let people even know that it's there. I mean, just because you build it doesn't mean people will come. That's mm -hmm. the hardest part of the, the, the equation um, at some level, I mean, mm -hmm. once you've got the basics down. So then it's really just a maximization um, enabler. Right. So that, that's really what it comes down to. So it, uh, you think it's never too early to be thinking about the, the, the level of detail you're talking about? Well, I mean, the whole point of when you have a small business, I mean, especially with when you're looking at online media and um, just the scale opportunities mm -hmm. that exist, um, the, it's really proof of concept on the fundamental model and margins of the business. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rest is just adding zeros. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the way I think about it. I mean, even with, with Quicken Loans, I mean, they just happen to be selling something very expensive. They're getting thousands of dollars from, right. a, from a given client. So I mean, already by nature, you know, if you add zeros, they're already in a huge, huge business and huge market. So, mm -hmm. um, so really, it's just proving out that, that it's just having the proof of concept and then scaling it up. So I do think it matters. Um, I don't think you have to approach it you know, you approach it size, it, it, it's gotta be size appropriate. Uh -huh. um, you can do things very simply in Excel, but it's more of a thinking um, ability too around it. I yeah. mean, I could, even if I didn't have certain metrics, I could, um, you know, put together things in a spreadsheet and um, just create placeholders and a straw man to try to basically at least fill in knowledge that already exists even if I don't yet have firm numbers, mm -hmm. and then later just have people running things and figuring it out. But you just, like you said, I mean, it's, it's about knowing what you don't know. Right. So that way you can make better decisions, and at least then you're aware. So it's all about awareness first. Right. And that comes from learning and, you know, your podcast and, and different ways to get perspective. Yeah. So um, what are you learning right now? What is next for you? I'm learning all the time, so it's, I always have trouble, like even if somebody asks me, what's your... What are you excited about? Um, what am I excited about? Well, I, I'm actually really excited about working with um, clients, because I'll tell you what, I mean, one thing, the thing I miss the most um, right now is, is solving problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's revenue problems, operational problems, I mean, it's such a creative thing mm -hmm. that, you know, it just really energizes me, and so um, that's... You know, I'm just really excited about you know finding new people, being able to help them, and apply what we know and have learned, and you know what we're still learning. Because I mean, I feel like knowledge. Um, I mean, these days, if you figure online, the there's new new things happening every two years. So it's kind of, it's kind of like Moore's law applied to the internet because. Mm -hmm. You know, every two years there's some new advertising channel that opens up or some new feature on something that unlocks a whole new wave of advertising possibilities or yeah. some new technology or whatever. So all these things are changing all the time. So in most industries, if I believe if they're changing like 15% a year, your, your, your knowledge is obsolete in five years. Mm -hmm. So 
I mean, you, no matter what, you need to stay on the forefront. I mean, maybe that's an extreme view of it, but you need to stay on the forefront of things. So I'm, I'm constantly learning and it's more like, what can we, how can we apply what we know? And then also through networking, what we're seeing and doing, seeing out there mm -hmm. and, and help people with that knowledge as well. Yeah, interesting. So um, if you go back to your college days and give yourself a piece of advice about this, this uh, business you're gonna grow, what, what would that advice be? Would be you, well, I would just start with, you know, because I started in college. I'd, I'd say, get your degree, Don't start go get a job, yeah. <laughs> play it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but it's, uh, I, I guess what I would say is, um, you know, really, the, the real enabler in a business is talent. Uh -huh. And it sounds like such a cliche. I mean, I remember when I won um, uh, the ENY Award and... Uh, I, I gave my acceptance speech and I was like, God, I know this sounds like such a cliche, but it's so true. I mean, you, your people make you. And so the more you can learn, I think the most important thing is as early as possible, hire great people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I, I'm lucky that I think I, I did that, but at the same time, there were points, there, there were points where I wish we would have just spent 30K more a year to hire, when we had two different people we could have hired to hire mm -hmm. the better person. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're so cash constrained, especially when you're growing, it's hard. that it's hard to justify those extra dollars. But in reality, I mean, when I look back about, I mean, I've cataloged like all the million dollar mistakes that, that we've made. Mm -hmm. And I've traced it back really just back to talent. I mean, it was certain people that didn't have the skill set to do it, and then it just cost us a lot of money. Yeah. And so um, I feel like if you can, Surround yourself with great people and be willing to pay for talent. Mm -hmm. and, and you know you have to look at salary surveys. A lot of people they they underpay people, mm -hmm. and they're not like even um, they're not even like reviewing what everybody's being paid and making adjustments even proactively just to mm -hmm. make sure they're staying competitive. Instead, yeah. they kind of look at it like, oh well, if somebody's not squeaking, let me just. Uh, uh, not pay them uh, what, what they're worth in terms of what the market is saying they're mm -hmm. worth. Um, so I feel like um, I feel like maybe in certain points, uh, having chosen people and, and, and having been willing to do that, I'm sure uh, in terms of other things, it's, it's also thinking about that from a talent standpoint overall. I mean, there were ways we could have just saved millions of dollars a year if we had just thought of like, well, let's just only get you know, two hundred thousand dollar plus talent or a hundred thousand dollar plus talent, and focus that in um, um, in one country where we can get the best of the best, and then do other functions where we can get the best of the best for dramatically less than what we were getting, you know, average talent for in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so, taking more of a global view. Outsourcing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily outsourcing. It doesn't have to be. Well, it not could necessarily be, outsourcing, but uh, like international expansion of the team. Yeah, just basically mm -hmm. go going where 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 the best talent is um, at the right price, right. and um, and and also then having more reach because there are certain regions where you can't just even find certain people. So mm -hmm. by nature, anyways, you have to um, either. I mean, we've had to relocate people yeah. uh, when we were in Philadelphia multiple times yeah. I mean, just to be able to find certain talents. So it's just thinking a little bit more globally about things, and that even goes to like. Um, points in time where we had products made in one place versus we could have done it in another place. And, and all that just allows you then to put the dollars back into marketing or do more with your organization. And so, um, but you have, to, you have to be open to it. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be one, one thing I would, uh, would do differently. Yeah. Um, so then think forward and, you know, towards like the end of your career or, or life even and, and, and imagine back, what would you like your, your legacy to have been? Well, uh, you know, I, I think about this far more today in terms of um, uh, just helping more people or um, yeah, I, I guess just after my last company, I mean, thinking, spent a lot of time thinking about like the the just business in general, what is value, what is, um, uh, what's the future of business? And I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick antidote and then I'll, I'll explain it, but essentially um, I believe that all businesses today need to be five-star businesses with at least four-star to five-star products. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just like the, the starting point. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, 
my, I really believe that, I mean, when think about people think about legacy and so forth, I mean, there's the certain things on the personal side, like, you know, have your kids, have incredible kids, like, I want them to be kind and I want them to be irreplaceable. I mean, if I, if I were to boil down all the other values that they could have, I mean, um, those would be the two because if they're irreplaceable, then they're contributing to society and they're, they're um, uh, producing more than they consume and they're, they're just um, you know, benefiting humanity. But then at the personal level, I guess I kind of leave it as like if I can help more people um, improve their businesses, if I can ha have businesses that employ a lot of people, I really believe that the greatest form of charity is you're helping people to fish for themselves, you're, you're helping them have a job for themselves, you're creating jobs. It's not just, um, I mean, yes, you can invest your time and energy in specific causes and, and doing that, and that, that certainly is, is valuable and, and so forth. But it's, um, I actually believe that, uh, you know, we're at a time where if you can help create more jobs where people are losing jobs because of automation and where the world is going and you can inspire people um, to make themselves more irreplaceable, mm -hmm. I mean, that to me would be, a, would be a great legacy. So those are the things that I'm thinking about these days. And it's also like, how does business help society more maximize profit, but not just for the shareholder, it's also for stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I just believe there's a better model of business too. So thinking a lot about that. Now how that manifests itself, I'm not sure yet, but those are the kind of things that are bouncing around in my head. Yeah, beautiful. What do you think it means to be a modern entrepreneur? How are things different today than they were in the past? Well, change. Yeah. I mean, everything is changing so quickly. Yeah. And I mean, it's both exhilarating because I mean, I mean, when could you ever build like a hundred million dollar company, close yeah. to a hundred million dollar company in such a short amount of time? Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, when you look at like the, uh, what is it, the Fortune 500, I mean, the average length of a company on there is like 15 years and it used to be 75 years. No kidding. Yeah. So you, you're dealing with a, a world that's just changing so rapidly. So mm -hmm. it's the skill sets, I think, um, and this goes back to the legacy question. I mean, I, I believe the future is about being kind of an idea creator, an idea connector, and an idea um, coordinator. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, you know, I, I feel like it, it kind of starts at that level and how do you create value as opposed to just, um, uh, which is a little bit different than maybe what most people are prepared for because there is so much change coming. So modern entrepreneurship for me is just about dealing with change, adapting, um, you know, connecting the dots, pattern recognition, that kind of thing. Great. Thank you so much for being here, Dan. Absolutely. This is awesome. Uh, would you sign our wall? Oh, absolutely. Great. hit rock bottom fast. Like, uh -huh. like if there's something in your way that, a pattern that's gonna let you not be successful, and for me the pattern that I had that was not letting me be successful was too much complexity, pack riding stuff, uh -huh. taking on too much, yeah. and not doing any one thing well.